Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my lecture number 22. Today we talk about solar power and because this subject is so important and so huge, I think we have to split it at least into two lectures. Here you see my favorite picture. I took that about 10 years ago. I was invited to a solar power station in Sevilla in Spain and it shows you the big mirrors which have been used at that time for solar power stations about four meters of size and the picture is taken in the sunset so the mirrors are not directing to the sun here these big mirrors have been turned to the east here already and they are waiting for the sunrise in the next morning if you climb up the power tower here you see the same mirrors from above so you see really a huge of mirrors and you just see the evening sky reflecting in it. But before I come to the technology which allows us to harvest the solar energy, I would like to come back to the sun. So you remember from lecture four, I showed you these pictures here. So I explained to you the sun is our fusion reactor and it's in a large safety distance of 150 million kilometers away. And what we do here on the ground is that we either put there photovoltaics or other technology to harvest the sunlight. I want to spend one more minute on the sun as our fusion reactor because I think it's interesting to know at least a little bit about what is happening in the sun. So the energy is produced in the sun in the center, in the core of the sun. There the temperature is highest. It has 15.7 million degrees Celsius there. And it's so hot that nuclear fusion can happen. Nuclear fusion then produces new particles, the so-called neutrinos as one of them. Unfortunately, these neutrinos, they pass through all the sun, then fly to the earth and cross the earth without any disturbance. The neutrinos take quite a lot of energy out of the sun, but there's no way for us to make use of this energy. What we can make use of is the light which comes from the sun, and this light has a full spectrum. It's not only the red, green and blue light, which we can see with our eyes, but it's also the infrared and the ultraviolet. Also that contains energy for us. And that is what we are going to harvest with solar power stations. One more comment about what is happening inside of the sun. So what are these nuclear reactions? Well, the sun consists originally mainly out of hydrogen, hydrogen at very hot temperature. As you know from your school lessons in chemistry, hydrogen consists out of a nucleus, which is a proton, and an electron, which is around this proton. And most part of hydrogen is empty. If you heat up hydrogen to very high temperatures, as in the core of the sun, then the electron is lost. It's flying around somewhere in the sun, but it's not connected to the nucleus anymore. So there's basically a gas of protons in the sun at very high temperatures. And these, those protons, they collide every now and then. Normally in these collisions of protons, there's nothing happening, except sometimes, very rarely, it happens that there's a so-called weak interaction happening. And in this reaction of the two protons, there's a neutrino emitted. The neutrino, as I told you, flies out of the sun and what is left over is that one of the protons is converted into a neutron and the electric charge leaves the proton as a positron. The positron then is eaten up by the electrons which are flying around. So there's an annihilation of matter and antimatter, so electron and positron, and they annihilate into radiation. So the only thing which is then left and which is new is the neutron and the proton which are bound together as a deuterium nucleus. This deuterium nucleus is stable and therefore it releases energy when it is produced. And that is part of the radiation which heats up the sun. Then if you have deuterium and hydrogen, you have something which we know from nuclear bombs, from H-bombs. What happens if they come close to each other, they fuse into a helium-3 nucleus and thereby they also release energy. That is the energy which is released when there's a hydrogen bomb exploding. 
And the next step then is that two of these helium-3 nuclei again can do a fusion and they produce a helium-4 nucleus and two protons. And this helium-4 nucleus is a very stable nucleus. That means in the production of it, there must be a lot of energy released. And all these processes which I just explained to you and which are shown on this diagram here, all of them together produce heat in the sun. And that is the reason why the sun is so hot. And this hot sun then radiates light and infrared radiation and other type of radiation to the outer space. The good thing about the reaction is not only that it produces the energy which we can use, but very important is that the first reaction, so the reaction where the neutrino is generated and where the protons fuse as a first step of this fusion reaction chain, this process is extremely slow. For an individual proton it takes typically 9 billion years before it happens. And only because there are so many of these protons in the sun, it happens all the time. And it's enough processes to generate the energy which we need. If this process would not be so slow, then the sun would explode like a hydrogen bomb. And that, of course, then would be the end of our Earth. If you now remember our lecture about greenhouse effect, lecture number eight, there I showed you the solar spectrum, how it arrives on the Earth. This is this red histogram which you see there. And the job of a solar power station now is to absorb this full spectrum. So not only the visible part, but also the left part, which is ultraviolet, and the right part, which is near infrared. This all has to be absorbed to have a very efficient solar power station. And there are two basic ways to do that. One is you use photovoltaic cells. Photovoltaic cells have the nice property that they produce electricity out of the solar energy, which is just what we want and which is very convenient. However, they have the disadvantage that they cannot absorb all wavelengths efficiently. So they are normally tuned on one or a few of these wavelengths and only those can be very efficiently converted into electricity. The other way to produce usable energy out of solar power is solar thermal power stations. Solar thermal power stations do nothing but absorb all the radiation from the sun and convert it into heat. And then in a second step, the heat is used for something, for example, to produce electricity. So the big advantage of that is that the absorption of solar radiation can be very efficient and that it contains all wavelengths. So in principle, at least, one can absorb 100% of solar energy with a solar thermal station. The disadvantage is, first of all, that the conversion of the heat into electricity is usually not very efficient. And the second problem which we have is that if we heat up something by solar energy, normally this body starts to re-emit the heat. That is similar to also what we learned about the atmosphere in the greenhouse effect. So anybody who is absorbing something can also emit radiation. And therefore, solar power stations which absorb the heat have to have a certain material Typically, this material is coated with a certain chemical compound, which allows this material to absorb the solar light, but to not emit the infrared radiation so much. But we come later to these technical details. So before we come to details of the technology, I would just like to give you an overview of the different types of technology. This slide you know already from lecture number 17. This is my roof at home and there I have photovoltaic, which, as you know, produces directly electricity from solar radiation, which is very convenient. So especially for a rooftop application, photovoltaics is very easy to do. The other thing which I explained you, which I have at home, is a solar heating for my hot water here for taking a shower or for heating my house. 
and this solar heating station you see there at the back of the roof. So this solar thermal stations are used for hot water for heating but with some tricks you can also use it for refrigerating. So in hot countries you can take solar thermal energy and convert it into solar cooling immediately, which is also a very good thing for small applications. And then last not least, we come to the concentrated solar thermal power station. So this is something where you concentrate the solar light with a mirror and then you produce heat at a very high temperature and this high temperature heat then you can use either for process heat in chemical reactions or you use it for electricity production. So that is how these big solar thermal power stations work. Here you see a picture of the solar power tower which I also showed you already in lecture number 17. What I did not explain you so well is the solar trough technology, which you see there on the left upper picture. So this is a mirror which is formed as a trough in a parabolic shape and I will explain you in a minute how these things work. And down there you see a photovoltaic plant as you all know it already. The last thing we have not talked about is the dish Stirling machines. The dish Stirling machines were somewhat popular like 10 years ago. They work with a parabolic mirror like the dish which you use for your satellite TV. So they focus the sun on a very small spot and produce very high temperatures there. And then they have a Stirling engine. A Stirling engine behind allows them to transform the heat of this hot spot very efficiently into motion and the motion then goes into a generator and produces electricity. Such a dish Stirling machine is in principle a very simple device. It does not need any high technology, no semiconductors or anything complicated. Can be produced in any country easily and is in principle a very efficient machine. The only reason why nowadays it's commercially not used anymore is because photovoltaics became so cheap that photovoltaics, even though it is high technology, uh, is the preferred method to use because of its cheap way and its easy use of it. The disadvantage of a dish Stirling engine is that there are movable parts. This engine is running all the time during the sunshine. So it has to have some maintenance and this of course is something which is always more cost intensive than if you have just a photovoltaic cell which is laying around somewhere. So now I have shown you four different technologies and now before I come to more details about technology I would like to tell you some important differences between these technologies in the question about where to use which technology. You might remember from lecture 17, there I showed you a map of the solar power potential. So at which position on the earth you get how much output if you have a photovoltaic power station. This was in a unit of kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak and here kilowatt peak is basically the size of your photovoltaic power panel and then this map told you how much you get out of it in relation between the different positions. This is a nice map for photovoltaics but it doesn't tell you all about the solar irradiation and as you will see in a minute depending on what technology you are using you will have a different amount at different positions of the world. There we have to go now through a few notations which you have to learn about solar power and this has to do with the fact that if you have a different technology you might be more or less sensitive on clouds, on pollution or water vapor or dust for example. The next map here shows you the so-called DNI, direct normal irradiation. So it's a quantity measured in kilowatt hours per square meter and here. What is measured here? Well, you have a device which measures the direct 
solar radiation which directly comes from the sun and this map now tells you how much energy comes from the sun directly averaged over the whole year. A typical device which completely depends on this quantity here is for example the dish Sterling because this satellite dish focuses all the direct radiation. The same is true for the concentrated solar power stations which use a trough or a solar tower power. Now this map shows you the GHI. GHI means global horizontal radiation. Again measured in kilowatt hours per square meters and year. And this shows you how much solar radiation arrives on the ground, on a horizontal ground. So for example, if you have a photovoltaic panel which is horizontal on the ground, then this map tells you how much solar radiation arrives there. The next map now gives you the so-called global tilted irradiation at an optimum angle. So this is important if you have a solar plant with a lot of photovoltaic panels and you put the orientation of the panels into the optimum angle so that the average output is optimized. And then this map here tells you how much power you can harvest in such a solar plant per square meter and per year. So you see all these maps look in detail different and I would like to point out to you now the difference in the following comparison. I just take two random towns. The first random town is Gießen here in Germany where I'm placed at the moment and the other random town is Windhoek in Namibia as an example of a country where there is a lot of sun and nice weather a lot of time. So then I have listed all the quantities I explained you before. So for example the specific photovoltaic power output from the first map in Gießen is about 1073 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak and in Windhoek it's 1976 and if you compare these two numbers there's a factor of 1.8. If you take for example a photovoltaic panel from my roof and you put it to Namibia, the same photovoltaic panel will have a factor of 1.8 more energy output. That is why it makes a lot of sense to have in these good areas photovoltaics. The direct normal radiation in Gießen is 971 and in Windhoek it's 2837. So there the factor is much higher than before, so it's a factor of 2.9, which is almost 3. That means if you have a device which can convert the direct radiation into electricity, like a dish sterling or a concentrated solar power station, then the same solar power station in Namibia will have three times as much output than in Gießen. Therefore, in other words, it does not really make sense to have concentrated solar power in Germany. That is because in Germany there is not so much direct radiation because we have so many clouds. The next shows you the horizontal irradiation, which is a factor of 2.1 higher in Namibia. And then what is also interesting, if you look at the diffuse horizontal radiation, so that is the light which comes from the sky but not directly from the sun. And there we have 570 in Gießen and in Windhoek they only have 511. So there we are in Gießen better than in Windhoek. What is the reason for that? Well, if there are clouds on the sky, there is this white light shining down from the clouds. This is a diffuse radiation. If there is no clouds on the sky, this white light is missing. Therefore, in an area where there is always the sun shining, there is less diffuse radiation. If you compare the direct radiation and the diffuse radiation in Gießen, you find out that it's not quite a factor of two difference. If I remember correctly, when I was living in Hamburg, 
the diffuse radiation was even 50% of the total radiation. So there the direct and the diffuse are almost the same because there is so little sunshine. And then the last number of this kind is the global tilted irradiation at the optimum angle. This is a factor of 2 better in Namibia. So if you have photovoltaic panels at the optimal angle, you get a factor of 2 more out of it compared to what we have here. So now you know how to look up and calculate the irradiation of your different solar power stations. Now I would like just to use that to remind you about the desert egg concept from lecture 17. There we said it makes a lot of sense to have solar power stations in North Africa and transport the energy to Europe. And this is very nicely represented in this picture here, why it makes so much sense. Here you see the globe and the red areas show you the areas which have very good solar irradiation and where there are basically deserts in these areas. Then these yellow lights is a satellite picture of the Earth at night. And you see there's a lot of light at night in Europe, in North America, in Japan and in some other areas. So this somehow illustrates where most of the electricity usage is at the moment. And if you compare the two, what you can conclude as a scientist from it is you should produce solar energy in the red areas, in the deserts, but not only use it in the desert, but also transport it to the areas where there is this big electricity usage, so where these yellow lights are. And it turns out that about 90% of the world population live in a vicinity of a desert within something like 3000 kilometers. So with Today's technology is not a problem to supply electricity from deserts to almost everybody on the world. The other important number which I would like to focus you on is again the solar energy potential. In total it's about 340,000 electrical gigawatts averaged over the year and day and night with current technology, current efficiencies and so on. And this is about a factor of 20 more energy than is used in the whole world nowadays. In other words, we have more than 20 times the energy we need for our Earth. So at least in principle, there's nobody who can stop us from having a 100% renewable energy system. Solar energy from the deserts is already more than enough. And if we then add wind power and hydropower, and the solar energy from the non-desert areas, I think there's nobody who could say that we don't have enough energy available. We just have to harvest it. Now let's come back to the small solutions. So I come back to my roof and I would like to tell you a few things about solar heating for local use. So what do I have? I have a very nice solar thermal system. It's already not the cheapest ones, but it's a very good one. The important point for me was that um, we have a long winter in Gießen and I would like to use the solar thermal system also in the winter, not only in the summer. And there are a few of these systems available on the market. And I will show you the one which I have. How does it work? The point is that if you have a black surface and the sun is shining, it becomes hot and you can make hot water out of it. This is somehow trivial. But what about the winter? If it's minus 10 degrees outside and you have a black foil there and the sun is shining, the foil becomes warm, but it will immediately cool out because of the cold air temperature. You cannot use the simple systems in the winter. So they are only nice to have a hot shower in the summer. This system, however, you can have a hot shower also in the winter. So what is done to prevent this cooling out? Well, there are a few things which are important here. The first thing is this system has vacuum pipes. So the vacuum pipe prevents the pipe inside from cooling out. The pipe inside has 
a black absorber pipe. So the sunlight is absorbed by the inner black pipe and then the outer glass pipe prevents this pipe from cooling in the winter. So the sunlight can go in because glass is transparent. Then it produces the heat in the black pipe and the heat radiation of the black pipe cannot go easily through the glass because glass is not transparent for infrared light. And there's also no convection because of the vacuum pipe. Then there are two more things which improve the efficiency. One is there's a reflecting mirror here. So this is a kind of double parabola mirror and this double parabola focuses the light which passes the pipe from the back side and puts this light which passes on the side in addition onto the black pipe. In this way you increase the area of sunlight which is used and by this focusing you increase the temperature of the pipe and the pipe can still be rather small for that. So in a way the system I have is a kind of concentrated solar power system. The last thing which is a bit more difficult to understand is that this black pipe is coated with a certain chemical material. This chemical material has the property that it absorbs visible light, it absorbs near infrared light, but the real infrared light is not absorbed and it's also not emitted. So there are chemical products which allow you to absorb certain wavelengths and not to absorb other wavelengths and also not to emit other wavelengths. There's a physics law that says every wavelength which is absorbed with a certain efficiency will also be emitted in the same efficiency. So normally this physics law prevents you that you have an absorber pipe which absorbs but doesn't emit again. But for different wavelengths there's a trick to do that and this is done in this absorber parts. So you just should keep in mind that the absorber pipes have a certain coating which makes them look very black. So they absorb all wavelengths, including those parts which you cannot see by your eye. But at the same time, they do not absorb, but also not emit this infrared thermal radiation. Therefore, they stay hotter than comparable pipes, which are just simply black with whatever material. For completion here, you will have here a view of my cellar in my home. There on the top, you see pipes going along the ceiling. These are water pipes which go to the roof and come back from the roof. So they go with cold water up and they come back with hot water. That is what the solar thermal power station on top does. This hot water then goes into this big water tank. This is there normally in every household if you have a gas heating for example. But in my home this is especially big because I would like to store the hot water when there is sunshine so that even at night I can have a shower and even in the next morning it's still enough hot water there. So this hot water stores the water which goes through the pipe on the roof and then there's also a heat exchanger for the fresh water so if you want to have a shower you do it with the fresh water not with the water which goes through the heatings. And therefore you need a heat exchanger there. Then as in every heating system you need an expansion tank because the water can get very hot. Then it expands and when it's cold the water is compressed again. So this change of volume with temperature is always taken care of in an expansion tank. You need a special water pump to pump the water up to the roof and this has to be done in a controlled way. And um, then I have an additional gas heating for the winter because then the solar power is not enough. But otherwise it's not a complicated system. There's an electronics control in it and I can read out. For example, today I looked at it. Outside it was 21 degrees Celsius. So while I do videos under artificial light here, outside there's a nice sunny day. I looked at the temperature in the solar collector. It was 100 and 1.6 degrees. Sometimes it gets even much more hot because of course the water can be hotter than 100 degrees because it is under pressure. 
The pressure here at the moment is 1.2 bar and the temperature in the heat storage tank is between 63 and 69. The water has different levels in this storage tank. Uh, below it's the lowest temperature and above is the highest temperature. So everything works nice for like half of the year. I don't need any gas at all. And in the winter I need gas for heating the house, but still there is an additional support. So even if it's below zero outside, it can still produce in the solar panel temperatures of, for example, 140 degrees Celsius. So this is a very nice system and it's easy to use. But now we come back to the big systems. So we go to concentrated solar powers at large sizes. You might remember the total amount of solar energy is about one gigawatt per square kilometer roughly. In reality you need for one gigawatt a bit more than one square kilometer. But this is the order of magnitude. And therefore we should build big solar power stations in the desert so that we can harvest this big amount of energy. So here you see a similar system as I have on my roof, but much, much bigger. So this is a parabolic trough. It's one of these trough mirrors and the size of the mirrors is about four meters or so. You can get them at different sizes nowadays. It has, as my system at home, it has an absorber pipe and it has a parabolic trough mirror. And then you see on the corner, you see the heat transfer oil. So the absorber pipe at my home is running with water. Here you run it usually with heat transfer oil. This heat transfer oil can easily go up to like 400 and more degrees Celsius and it doesn't produce high pressures at these high temperatures. The concept of a parabolic mirror is probably known to you all. So this is a physics concept of optics which you all have learned in school. If you have a parabolic shape and you have a beam, you have light and parallel rays coming in, then all the parallel rays are focused on one point. And this one point then in our geometry is then a pipe. So this is a parabolic shape only in one dimension. In the other dimension, it's like a cylinder, so it's flat. So to remember, this kind of focusing is very efficient and it's quite cheap to do. The only thing you need is a pipe and a mirror, so you can make it in huge scale. But of course, you can only make use of the direct radiation as soon as there's clouds or if there's a fog or dust or smoke or something diffuse, then this focusing does not work anymore. Then you don't get the power. And this is a difference to photovoltaic, where you also make power out of diffuse light, not only out of concentrated focused light. Here on the right you see a picture where I take a picture of myself in the mirror. So you see me upside down here. And what you also see is below there you see all kind of distortions of the picture. This is because the mirror is not perfect. So there are distortions of some irregularities in the position of the mirror. This shows you one of the problems of this technology. So you have to have good mirrors and this also defines somehow the sizes. So the sizes which we have nowadays are typically maybe four meters big. If you make them bigger, the weight is larger and the wind load is larger. So you get larger forces, you get larger distortions. If you make it smaller, then of course you need more mirrors. So you have to have a compromise somehow. By the way, you can turn this mirror upside down completely. For example, if there's a storm or a sandstorm where you want to protect the surface. Now we should spend a few more minutes on the absorber pipe. So you see also here the absorber pipe is done in a similar way as on my roof. You have a glass pipe which is evacuated and in the glass pipe in the vacuum you have a metal pipe. This metal pipe is coated with a specific material which as I told you before absorbs the light almost 100%, but 
but does not absorb thermal radiation and as it does not absorb it from some physics law it follows that it also doesn't emit it. So it cannot radiate out the heat very efficiently and therefore the heat stand, stays in the pipe. There's also no convection because of the vacuum. So in other words, this absorption pipe is constructed in a way so that it efficiently absorbs all the light and keeps the heat inside. Inside of the pipe there is this thermal transfer oil at the temperatures of, for example, 400 degrees. And this transports then the heat into the power generator. So here you see an example again of a parabolic trough system. And on the next picture you see something very similar. But this uses not parabolic mirrors, but it uses Fresnel mirrors. Instead of a parabolic mirror, where you have a parabolic continuous shape, you can imagine a Fresnel mirror as a parabolic mirror which is cut into slices and then the slices are all put on a flat line and this way then you have a system which consists out of basically flat small mirrors and still has a focusing property. In this Fresnel systems you have on top in addition a reflecting mirror so a second parabolic reflecting mirror uh, to make the whole system simpler to construct. So that even if the light which comes back from the Fresnel mirror, even if it misses the pipe but is in the vicinity of the pipe, it's still reflected back onto the pipe. So this system has uh, quite a few advantages, especially it is much cheaper to produce this smaller flat mirrors instead of these huge parabolic mirrors but it's on the other hand not quite as efficient because the Fresnel mirrors are not perfect for this application. The concentrated solar power technology is not really a new technology. Actually the first solar power station like that was constructed more than 100 years ago. This was done in Egypt so you see on the picture the parabolic mirrors and the pipes. At this time the pipes didn't contain this oil but there is just simple water in it. And here you see a second picture. This is almost 100 years later and it's almost at the same place in Egypt. But this time it's modern technology and there's also a colleague from mine from Visatec who visited this solar power station. So the basic technology is still the same as 100 years ago. So you see here in a magazine from the year 1916, the functionality of this power station. You see this big mirror field with these parabolic reflectors. In the focus of the reflectors there were the absorbers and the absorbers used water. The water was heated up and there was steam produced. The steam went into a steam engine at this time. Nowadays you don't use steam engines, you use turbines. And then the steam engine was driving a dynamo, so which is nothing else but an electrical generator. And then there on the right you see the power lines going to the users. Very important in all these concentrated solar power stations is the condenser, which we have not talked about yet. So if you want to run a machine on hot steam, it only works if you have not only a hot part of the machine, you also need a cold one. Therefore you need this condenser which cools down the steam and condenses it. In this case here it's just a bundle of pipes which are cooled by the air in the area. In a modern solar power plant it looks all very similar. So you have this huge mirror field here. This is a concentrated solar power station in Spain. You have these solar troughs and then the heating and the condenser and everything is not easily seen on the picture. But what you see is two big tanks. And these tanks are for energy storage. They store heat and in this way this kind of concentrated solar power station can run also at night. So at night when there is no heat from the solar field 
they use the heat in the tanks and during day they heat up the material in the tanks to have heat for the night. The material in the tanks is usually hot liquid salt at all the, on the order of 300 to almost 400 degrees Celsius. So if you heat up salt, if you have solid salt, you heat it up, it becomes at some point liquid. And this liquid salt then can be stored in tanks and run through pipes. So it's a very efficient way to store thermal energy. This salt is also very cheap because it comes from the fertilizer industry. And here you see the diagram how these concentrated solar power stations work nowadays. On the left you see the solar collector fields. Nowadays these green lines, these pipes, are filled with thermal oil. So the thermal oil comes from below, is heated up in the field and then goes back as hot oil on the top. There it goes to heat exchangers and these heat exchangers the hot oil is heating up water. So there's the blue lines are water pipes. So water from below is heated up in the heat exchangers and the hot water becomes steam in the last station. And then the hot steam goes out on the right to a steam turbine. So this steam turbine is a modern equivalent of a steam engine, only that a steam turbine is much more efficient. And then the steam turbine runs a generator and this produces electricity. Also the steam turbine needs a condenser. So you need to cool the condenser from outside. If you use water cooling, it is the most efficient way to do it. On the other hand, if you run the thing in the desert where there's not enough water, then you have to cool your condenser with air, which is possible, but this air cooling costs you a few percent of your efficiency. Then the cooled water is then reused in the next cycle. So this is the simplest way. And in this way, of course, as soon as the sun is gone, there's no electricity out. Even if only a field of clouds is passing at this moment, the heat stops and the turbine stops and there's no electricity coming out. So if you go to the desert where there is almost always sun, then it's nice, there are not so many clouds, but still there can be sometimes clouds also in the deserts. This, if you do it, for example, in the south of Spain, you have quite a few of these clouds at certain times of the year. So what do you do in addition? You need a backup for the case when the clouds are passing by. And this is done nowadays by using natural gas. So like in my heating at home, in addition to the solar power, I have a gas heating. And whenever there's not enough solar power coming, then I switch on the gas. And so for these few days in Spain, it's not worth to have to think about anything in addition. So this gas backup in future could be hydrogen backup with green hydrogen. So this is also a concept which works on the long term in a sustainable way. But now we have this, still the big problem that every night there is no sun. And if you run every night with natural gas, this is not the main purpose of a solar power station. So we need some solution for the night shifts. And for that, we have seen in the previous picture the salt tanks. So you actually have two tanks, one tank with hot salt and one tank with cold salt. And what is done in many of these power stations is that if you have a cold tank in the morning, and cold means in this case maybe 300 degrees Celsius, so that the salt is still liquid, then you heat up the salt, bring it to like 380 degrees Celsius, store it in the hot tank for the next night. And then in the evening you have the hot tank full and the cold tank is empty. And then you start to use the heat from the hot tank, produce steam from it, and then bring this hot salt into the cold tank. This means you need several heat exchanger. You need a heat exchanger between the thermal oil and the water. You need a heat exchanger between the thermal oil and the salt. 
And these heat exchangers, of course, are additional investments and sometimes also they lose some efficiencies. There are different technologies around now to circumvent that, to get rid of these heat exchangers. One possibility is, and there are solar power stations working this day, is that you don't use thermal oil anymore, but you just heat up the water. So the water goes directly through the solar field and there it produces steam in the solar collector field and this direct steam out of the field can then run the turbine. So this way you don't need the thermal oil at all and you don't need the heat exchanger between the oil and the steam. Another technology which is also working is that you replace the thermal oil with liquid salt. So what you do is you run your liquid salt through the collector field and then the hot liquid salt is directly going either into the tank or into the heat exchanger to produce steam. So also here you have the advantage that you can use the same liquid in the solar field as in your storage tank. All these different systems are being tested in different power stations and in principle all these things work. All of them have advantages and disadvantages and all that are technological questions and questions of efficiency and price. The disadvantage of the direct steam production is that then the whole mirror field has a high pressure because the steam at several hundred degrees Celsius has a very high pressure. The disadvantage of the liquid salt is that liquid salt, when it becomes cold, becomes solid. So if at some point of the operation the salt becomes too cold in one of the pipes, then the pipes block. So you have to have an additional heating for all the pipes to be able to start up the running again. So you see, in principle, this technology is 100 years old and it was revitalized in the last 10 or 20 years. It's a major technology. You can buy this concentrated solar power stations basically key ready. But to improve the technology and to make it cheaper and to make it more efficient, there are a lot of technological questions which have to be studied. So we need additional research money for that and we need clever engineers who solve all the technical problems in the best way. But nevertheless, I think these solar traps are a technology which can be used and can also be used in large scale nowadays. People in this business say that the cost for solar heat at high temperature will be below one cent per kilowatt hours. And then with the backup and the heat storage, you have the possibility to produce electrical power on demand 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And the cost for that in near future will be on the order of four cent per kilowatt hours, which is quite good taken into account that this already includes the electricity storage basically. So the electricity storage is realized here as a heat storage and the conversion of heat to electricity is available in the solar power stations anyway. So there are not additional costs for the storage in this case. This now should be enough for today. Next lecture we will go to solar power towers and I see there is really a huge potential also there. And solar power towers have the big advantage that they focus in two dimensions. The solar trough only focuses in one dimension because of the cylindrical mirror and the focusing in two dimensions allows much higher temperatures and higher temperatures also mean higher efficiencies. So let's see next time what we learn about the solar power towers. Thank you and see you next time.